afternoon. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Partho Ghosh. Till recently, I was a fellow in Nehru Memorial. Bernard Dufresn is an avid reader of Romarola. Over the years, he has collected and studied most of his works. He has also searched for documents on him in Indian libraries and archives, which were not known in France. He is distant, distantly related to Rola. Having lived for 11 years in India during various periods from 1984 to present day, Dufresne was struck by the strong correlation between Rola's approach to the flow of life and the Indian one. He has also studied in depth the relationship between Rola and various Indian personalities, including Gandhi, Mirabin, and now Nehru. We in India, as school children, we used to talk about Romarola and Gandhi, Romarola and Tagore, but we never talked about Romarola and Nehru. That way we are very fortunate that we have with us our speaker who will be talking on Romarola and Nehru. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll decide that this small village in Burgundy is too small for them. Romain Roland must have a bright future, and they will move to Paris. His father, who had that good uh, position, will be just a clerk in a bank. But that's OK. He has a good character. He will, uh, he's happy that it's good for the family, and he's happy like that. And Romain Roland will start having on his shoulder a very heavy weight. My family has sold everything there has moved to Paris, and now I have to deliver. They are here because I must make good studies and become somebody important. But he can cope with that. He, th he goes on with his uh, internal, very strong internal life. <clears throat> and some important elements take place. Few, a few years later, they are in Switzerland, in uh, Geneva, this family kept uh, traveling here and there. And he has a kind of flesh, which he will, he will call uh, l'éclair uh, de Genève. And suddenly it appears to him that the world which he sees is not the real world, is only part of a bigger world which is outside and which in this very precise moment he has the impression that he saw that external world. Some years go on, and a second one will happen. <clears throat> when he's reading a philosopher called Spinoza, uh, Spinoza was an interesting person. He was a Jew, but not practicing the Jew religion, so very much, uh, very much connected with God, but not with any precise religion. And there, when, while reading Spinoza, he has what he calls the Spinoza flash. And he understands that his personality does not exist, that he's only part of huge ocean, which is a great movement, and that individuals are just one aspect of that. He says, in that moment, my personality has vanished. I, I, was, taught, I was taken by this huge oceanic, oceanic feeling, which after that will put him in contact, obviously, with the Hindu uh, religion, as well as with Sigmund Freud, because in this oceanic, oceanic feeling, you can see a lot of psychoanalysis as well. He has to deliver, so he's in the best schools uh, in Paris, and he applies for the most difficult schools after that. The most difficult being Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, the one from which uh, Sartre and so many famous people came out. <clears throat> So he tries the first time, doesn't work. The second time, doesn't work. Unfortunately, the third time, he succeeds. 
and he enters Ecole Normale Supérieure. And Ecole Normale Supérieure will be for him a magic world. He does not need to study that much for examinations. He is surrounded by other intellectuals like him who um, are interested just by the movement of ideas. And through that, he is in contact with all the thinking which is happening in the world. And there is one particular thinker who is important to him at that time, and it is Tolstoy. He belongs to a group of students who are fond of this new uh, vision of the world, Eastern uh, Asiatic vision of the world, coming out of, uh, coming in the uh, novels of uh, Tolstoy. Now he has finished, he graduated, uh, he has finished his studies, and he starts teaching, because he's a teacher, and he starts also working. The first thing he will do is theater, because for a man who was to change the world, he thought theater was an interesting interaction between art and people. So he will write several pieces of theater, most of them about French Revolution. You mentioned uh, the Danton, for example. And he will have some success. Uh, initially, he's played only small ones, then he's played in uh, better ones. And then finally, one of his, of his work is played at uh, Comédie Française, which is quite prestigious. But then he has a problem. In order to do that, he has to make a lot of compromises. He has to beg people. He has to arrange diplomacy, then such and such will tell it to such and such person, and all that. And this is something which he does not like at all. He is at the mercy of the goodwill of other people whom he does not trust so much. So, and his, th his theater is also not extremely successful. So he decides to go another way. He will keep during his life, he will uh, write other theater plays, which, according to me, are very good and very interesting, and as you said, sometimes also, uh, interestingly, you can find a lot of principle of Bhagavad Gita inside. So he starts something different, and since he's a musician, he has a hero, and his hero is Beethoven, Tolstoy in literature and Beethoven in music. So he will start writing a biography of uh, Beethoven, and he will publish it in a very small magazine, not famous at all. He will now try to do something more difficult. He will invent his own hero. He will write a novel about a hero he has created himself from the best he knows, the best things he knows from uh, everywhere. And to write this uh, novel, he will take something like eight years. It will be a 1,500 pages uh, novel. And the name is Jean Christophe. <clears throat> and this Jean Christophe will have a huge success. Uh, Beethoven had some success, but this will make him, you know, he will give him a name to a whole generation. And when in 1916 uh, he will receive the Nobel Prize for Literature, most probably, it's secret, so nobody knows why they gave him that prize, but most probably the two reasons why he received the, the prize was, first of all, Jean Christophe, which was this incredible social event, and secondly, Over the Battle, Au-dessus de la Mêlée, this uh, article. And in fact, it was something in between Nobel Prize for Literature, which he received, and Nobel Prize for Peace, which he also would have deserved. So the second part of my uh, talk will be about the strong relationship between Romain Roland and India. Uh, this relationship starts when he's a student. He reads Gita and many uh, and many other uh, 
things on India. But in 1918, he will start having strong relations, first of all with uh, Tagore. It's probably the, the, his uh, first important contact with India. He will meet at that time a lot of uh, Indians who are in Paris, uh, who are in Europe, and will inform him about the Indian situation. <coughs> He's, he does not speak English, but fortunately his sister is a teacher of English and will translate everything to him. And gradually, uh, he, after, uh, after Tagore, he will meet uh, Gandhi, not meet him, but meet the thinking of Gandhi. And in 1922, he is asked by an editor in uh, Madras to write the introduction of a publication about Gandhi. He tries, he starts to uh, gather information here and there. Uh, after that, he refuses to write that uh, introduction. And one year later, he has gathered so much information that he is now able, and he has so much appreciated uh, the, the, the movement uh, of Gandhi in India, that he will write a book on Gandhi itself. Let us shift to the third part, uh, which was the original theme. Uh, what he is doing, uh, what is the relationship between Romain Roland and Nero? <coughs> the relationship was not as strong as it was with uh, Gandhi, but I think it was very important, and I'll tell you why. The first exchanges of letters between the two came quite late. It was in 1926. Uh, and the reason for that at that time is that uh, Nehru's wife was being treated against tuberculosis in Switzerland. And obviously, Gandhi had asked uh, to Nehru uh, to meet Roland, uh, who was his close friend. And they will first meet in May 26. They will also discuss about the worrying situation of uh, Hindu-Muslim uh, division. At that time, there were fights between the two communities, which, according to Nehru, was a pure creation by the colonial power. And he said the best proof is that in the countryside, where 80% of the Indians live, there is no problem between Hindu and Muslims. One year later, Nehru is back to Europe. He has been invited to a, a very important conference called the Congress of Oppressed Nationalities in Brussels. Nehru w was very keen at putting the Indian struggle on the world map. He thought this should not be restricted to the relationship between India and Britain we will succeed if we are able to have the world opinion with us. And so this was a very good, this uh, Congress of Oppressed Nationalities in Brussels, in Belgium, was a very good opinion, for, uh, a good way for him to transmit this to the world opinion. And this is what he went there. When he comes back, obviously, he will come again to see his wife, who is again in Switzerland to treat uh, her, um, her lungs, and he will meet again with uh, Romain Roland. And they will discuss, what they will discuss at that time is Romain Roland is organizing what he calls a summer school to promote peace. He wants to train young people uh, to uh, organizing events to promote peace. And he thinks that if he can have some Indian leader talking about non-violence, this would be an excellent for this conference. But unfortunately, uh, Nehru is not available. He has to go back at that time, and no other Indian leader will be available. So this summer conference, even though Roland would have liked it, does not have any Indian. Three years later, in 1925, uh, Lal, uh, Lajpat Rai is dead. Uh, he, he was obviously an important freedom fighter, and Roland had met him on several occasions. So he will write a very nice letter to the Congress in India uh, about 
what he thought about uh, Lashpat Rai. And this letter will be read in public. And in fact, Nehru, it will be Nehru who will inform him of that. Thank you very much, dear friend, for the, the nice paper you have written on uh, Lash Patrai, and I'm glad to inform you that it was uh, that it was read in public. And Nehru will conclude, which I think is important to cite. It's a great consolation to us that in our struggles in India we have the sympathy of great thinkers ag across the seas, like you. Mr. Roland. Then there will be an interruption. Uh, Nehru will go to prison for uh, several years. No contact is established, but the relation is still very active. And their last meeting will be in 35. In, in uh, September 35, Nehru is relieved from jail. He has spent almost four years of his life in jail. Finally, he is released. And very soon, he will fly again to Europe to see his, at, at least, I don't know which other reason, but also to see his wife, who is again treated again tuberculosis in Switzerland. And on this occasion, of course, he will meet Romain Roland again. Again, they will speak about their common fascination for Gandhi. And Roland writes in his diary, Gandhi has done and will always do things which will disconcert his friends. There is something unpredictable about him. And on the social question, no one can succeed in, no one can succeed in making him take a clear stand. But Nehru also admires the fact that in the field of action, Gandhi makes few mistakes. He will pronounce decisively and he will go much further forward than he does when at rest and in intellectual discussion. So the description of Nehru is obviously as Gandhi as a man of action. But if both men admire Gandhi, they also dissent. And their dissent is for the same reason, their attraction to socialism. So on that day, in October 1935, we have in the same room two great minds who help to solve the same problem. How to combine nonviolence and socialism. And the, in his diary, what uh, Omar Roland writes about that meeting is really very interesting, and I will again read you some uh, extracts from that. Roland Roland writes that according to Nehru, after all, Gandhi's nonviolence is, in many of its essential features, a form of violence, or more exactly, an extreme form of constraints exercised on those who practice it as well on those who undergo it, be it non-cooperation or strikes. And Roland writes, and Nehru also comes to recognize that the worst violence is not always physical violence, and that the kind which is exercised morally can even at times be more equal. And so Roland is happy to conclude about that discussion. There is no unsurmountable barrier between violence and nonviolence, and the first cannot be eliminated a priori from the field of action. So, good achievement from that meeting. But again, a second dissent is surfacing between Gandhi and both Romain Roland and Nehru, and it is on class warfare and socialism. And then Roland, Roland, Roland is a bit aggressive about Gandhi. He cannot make up his mind to admit of class warfare. He never stops wanting to believe in the good faith of his adversaries, even when they have shown their bad faith. Then it is too much. And he adds, I have been waiting in vain for a letter with Gandhi, which Gandhi promised me in reply to my question about socialism. In fact, Romain Roland 
and Gandhi exchange many letters, but there is one point on which Gandhi never replied and always said, I will reply later. It was that question about socialism. This is, too, this is a bit too much for Nehru, so Nehru tries to calm him down, and he wants to comfort his French friend, saying, also Gandhi is exposed to socialism, he nevertheless helped in the constitution of the Social Socialist Party in Congress by encouraging his friends not to oppose it. So, uh, after all, as a politician, uh, Gandhi has made no harm to socialism, which obviously is not interesting for Roland. Roland is certainly not a politician. He's not interested in the fact that uh, uh, even though uh, Gandhi was a socialist, he got promoted into the party. Uh, he is worried by the fact that Gandhi has not, uh, never accepted that. Many more subjects will come during that uh, important meeting, the most important meeting between the two, like intouchability, uh, the next Congress in February 36, and so on. The rest of the relationship between Roland and uh, Nehru will go through his sister. Madeleine Roland, I, as I said, she translated from, for, from English to French, and uh, she was a very humble person. In fact, in France, nobody ever notices the presence of Madeleine Roland. And now, after she had talked to Gandhi and after she had talked to Nehru, she will speak in the, in the, in the place of, uh, of, of Romain Roland. And for example, uh, she will help Nehru publish some articles in Europe. Uh, she will offer to him to translate some of these, these articles uh, in Europe. She will alert uh, Nehru on the fact that uh, a Bengali writer, Somian Ranat Tagore, who was an extreme leftist, would speak badly about Gandhi and that this was bad in Europe. So please, Mr. Nehru, bring, give me some articles so that I can publish them, uh, so that I can defend uh, Gandhi in Europe. And the last interaction between the two is in February 1936, when uh, Romain Roland writes to Nehru about one important event he's organizing in Geneva, which will be a universal assembly for peace, it's 36, four years before World War II. Uh, peace is something very important, and at that time, Roland is very much into socialist principles. The young Roland had refused to be involved in any political movement, but as I said before, during the last 15 years of his life, he came very close to the socialist movement as he thought that only this movement could bring peace in Europe and relief to the poor working class. And in his reply, Nehru will stick to their old fraternity. I am entirely one with you in your general outlook as to what should be done. I realize the importance of the Great World Congress for Peace. I hope that the Indian Congress will be able to take part of it. I don't have the answer to that. I don't know if ultimately somebody from the Congress went there, but at least I understand that Nehru was very enthusiastic about that. Soon after that, uh, Kamla Nehru will die from uh, tuberculosis, and this is the reason why there is not much of relationship, at least direct relationship, between both of them. Nehru will have no more reason anymore to come to Switzerland. But he has not forgotten his old friend. And in 1956, 20 years after their last meeting, and 12 years after Roland's death, he is requested to write an introduction to a publication on the correspondence between Gandhi and Romain Roland. 1956, uh, he is Prime Minister on India, of India with a heavy agenda. But he takes the time to write a very nice text 
of which I will read some extract as these words remain meaningful to us and this will be also my conclusion. Nehru writes, amongst the many remarkable qualities of Gandhiji, the two most outstanding, so I'm sorry, this is a preface of a book, the introduction of a book, which is the correspondence between Gandhi and Romain Roland. This book was done in India, uh, was translated afterwards in India by um, publication division, and it's, it was really, the in Indian version was much better than the French one. It was really a very interesting book, and this is the introduction. So among the mo many remarkable qualities of Gandhiji's, the two most outstanding were, I think, the absence of fear and freedom from hatred. Today, fear and hatred grip the world. I cannot imagine a worse companionship for an individual or a nation than that of fear and hatred. Gandhiji trained and molded the Indian people for half a century. Our people quarrel with each time, some, which is with each other sometimes, but I think that on the whole, they are singularly free from hatred. And obviously he thinks this is the merit of Gandhi. I had the privilege of meeting, this is what Nehru writes, of meeting Romain Roland on several occasions at Villeneuve 30 years ago. I was greatly impressed by him, and, and though he was so different from Gandhi, I sensed a certain communion of spirit between the two. These two men, with different backgrounds and experiences, met on a higher level and recognized each other. Perhaps this correspondence in this correspondence, we can to some extent sense this community of spirit of two great.